Hi folks, let's test out some new end mills. We've got two different 3 8 inch end mills from Helical Tool. They're both 3 8 inch, they're both for aluminum, they're both three flute. The big difference is the helix. One of them is 35 degrees. We'll use that for sort of normal cutting and quote unquote roughing. The other tool has a 45 degree and I'm actually really excited to see how that works as a finishing tool. The part we're gonna make, this test block. So we've got some pretty good adaptive recipes, a horizontal to clean it up, 2D contour to do that finishing, and a quick chamfer. So why do this test? What's important? When I first got started, all I cared about was how much an end mill cost. Seriously, I couldn't afford very much. That was what made the decision whether I buy the tool or not. Now, there are a ton of features that I care about. Now, it's not just the price of the tool, it's the value of the tool. How long does that tool last? It's the availability, can I get them? Different features, different lengths, different radii are really important to us now. How much support and information is there around the feeds and speeds? One of the things that's unique for us is I like to buy tools from people that care. As this Instagram and YouTube world of machining has grown up, it's fun to support companies that actually help pay it forward with knowledge and sharing and participating in this community. They still gotta be great tools, but that's something that helps us too. Do I think they're gonna be around? Is this something that I'm gonna bank on as a company that's gonna be providing tools that we can build into our, our database and get comfortable with and also serve as finishes? And that's what I'm excited to see here is what can we do to get some pretty killer service finishes? Let's have some fun. I first heard about Helical actually at the 2015 Autodesk University when they did a class showing off their milling advisor software. And this really caught my eye. And then we've seen them at so many shops that we toured. The most recent one that comes to mind was I saw Jay Pearson taking a cut that I thought was crazy on his Haas with a fourth axis with a pretty, uh, pretty insane axial depth of cut and a pretty aggressive radial depth of cut. I've always kind of wondered what's so secret sauce about all these different carbide tooling companies. But if anything, the fact that Helical seems to put such a good emphasis on the information caught my eye. So the first tool is this three flute 45 degree helix. If we grab the part number off the box and we type in that EDP number, 59091, tab over, I've already picked wrought aluminum. This is your standard 6061 condition. Usually we get our stuff in T6. I think that's the most common if you're not certain. And what's nice is it automatically pulls up all this information. They're calling it a bullnose tool, and that's technically correct because there is that 10 thou radius on the corner. I think of a bullnose tool as something, though, that has a lot more radius that you could use for surfacing. Here, the 10 thou radius, for me, really just gets rid of the weakest point of that tool, which would be if it came to a sharp point. Those are the weakest points of the tool. They're the first to break off, and it starts this downward spiral of surface finishes and and tool life. We're holding it in a Cat 40 spindle with an ER collet. We've got up to 15,000 RPMs on the VM3, 500 inches a minute. And that's what I like about the software. It's relatively easy to use and they've got some really intuitive sliders that help you evaluate the decisions here. Uh, so machine setup is done. For now, we'll leave the speed adjustments at their standard settings in the middle. And then tool path. For this one, we're gonna be doing high efficiency machining. So select this only if you actually have that. If the adaptive for fusion is, is fair game for that. So stick out, axial depth of cut, radial depth of cut. I think this is a pretty aggressive cut. If we pop those factors into the speeds and feeds worksheet that we've got, 255 inches a minute at 0.875 depth of cut and a 0.125 width of cut, 27.89 cubic inches of material removal and actually only eight horsepower, and sure enough, if we take a look, they've got the MRR as well here, which tells us we're doing our math right. We've got two slider bars. This one is axial or depth of cut, and this one is radial or width of cut. And I like the fact that if you slide this, so let's say if we slide it over here to the right, it's decreasing the radial depth of cut. Take a look at this warning. Your depth of cut is too low, you might rub. Go back to the video we did on the intro to feeds and speeds and we talked about the effects of chip thinning and rubbing and how it can cause premature tool failure. Likewise, we drag it the other way, catastrophic tool failure, it mentions because of the chip evacuation issues. Awesome, I like that. Back in Fusion, we've got a 3D adaptive set up to do this roughing, 15,000 RPMs. We've got the 5.7 thou per tooth or about 0.15 millimeter per tooth set up as our feed rate. 
one eighth of an inch or about 3.2 millimeter width of cut and 0.875 or about 22 millimeters depth of cut. We'll then use that same tool for a horizontal strategy. We'll keep our radial stock though, so that'll clean up the floor, but it's going to stay off those sidewalls as it comes around, which is important because I want to be very conscious of the amount of material that we leave for the finishing tool path. Let's take a look at the speeds and feeds. Grab that EDP number, 03347. Pulls up that 45 degree finishing end mill, square corner, same work holding setup, same settings here change our tool path to finishing, and it's gonna give us that 20 thou radial depth of cut, same axial depth of cut, gives us our feeds and speeds, 2.7 thou per tooth. It's about 0.07 millimeters per tooth. We plug that into a 2D contour in Fusion 360. Again, 15,000 RPMs, 2.7 thou per tooth feed rate. Quick tip though, I selected the top of each box. It was way easier to do that than to deal with having to select the bottoms. And in some cases, you don't even have uh, the right geometry. Then under heights, instead of the default, which is selected contours, which of course would have machined the top of each box, I just changed the selection to face and picked that floor. Then I'm staying one thou off the floor. And the idea there is a, t it's a tip I learned in a Boeing PowerPoint that somehow made its way around the internet on machining tips, which is only ask the end mill to do one thing. Let's ha just have it cut on the side here. Let's not have it cutting on the floor. So we'll leave 1,000th of clearance. It's not much, but in theory or in practice, we've got our, if we've done our tool setting correctly, which shouldn't be a problem at all with the Renishaw system, it is not going to be cutting on the floor. You want to find the low spot of the eccentric ring, put that at the bottom or six o'clock, and then pivot the ER nut in on that low spot of the ring. Makes it much easier to snap in. These regular ER collets aren't too difficult to do, but if you get a through spindle coolant collet, they are much stiffer and they're almost impossible to install unless you put them in that correct way. You must use a torque wrench for ER collet systems, both to ensure ample clamping power, but also the correct amount and the consistent amount. We're using 85 foot-pounds here. Let's check tool run out. Checking tool run out, Mitsutoyu one ten thousandths of an inch dial test indicator. Look at this, folks. This is phenomenal. That is awesome. Checking our block to make sure it will sit down on our parallels. We're gonna use a torque wrench. Who remembers the 4140 block? Not good. One last simulation check before we run the code. Look at the machine move. I couldn't believe it. The speeds of these aren't crazy, yet they are at the same time. I thought there was a chance we may have some sort of immediate problem and the tool just absolutely owned it. It sounds beautiful. And after a few seconds, I thought, oh my gosh, this is, we're fine. This is gonna work great. That little tinny sound you heard was a thin wall of material at the edge of the part just getting pushed away. Usually it's not a problem, but you do have to be careful. Those actually can cause problems with tooling. It sounds amazing. I was really excited. And look at the motion control. Yes, it's a bummer we have to run flood coolant here, but there's no other way to run the tooling this fast. Although, one of the things I wanna work on is dry cutting in all materials, including aluminum. You can do it but it will change your feeds and speeds. So more coming on that.
All right, before we run the finishing pass, we've got to take a look at this. You can see the chip we were pulling up during the adapter, a heck of a chip. You know, 875 deep, it's got real thickness to it. And that finish, look at that. That's a roughing strategy and that's not half bad. Again, we're only roughing right now. Silky smooth. I'm very impressed. Now let's try the finisher. Moving now into the 3D adaptive to clean off the tops of the parts. Then we're gonna rerun this and we're gonna take a different recipe on each of the nine blocks and compare. So here we are, great finish. I think we can do better. So we're going to do two different finishing strategies. This time, we're doing the recommended recipe from the helical mill advisor around each of the nine blocks. So now we're walking around each of the blocks. We're starting with one thousandth of an inch feed per tooth. So that's 15,000 RPMs, 45 inches per minute. And then each subsequent pass, we're gonna increase the feed rate by half a thousandth of an inch feed per tooth and we're gonna compare what that finish looks like. With nine blocks, that means we'll end up at five thousandth of an inch feed per tooth. But remember, we're taking a negative 15th out radial stock to leave because we had already machined these to their nominal size. Don't forget the effects of chip thinning. With a 15th out width of cut and a five thousandth of an inch programmed feed rate, the, with the effect of chip thinning, it's actually closer to a 1.7th out feed per tooth. Let's see how we did on the tolerances. Now remember, we did 15 thou negative stock to leave on each end, and these were one inch cubes, so they should be 0.97 inches. We're using the most accurate tool I've got in the shop, which is our Mitsutoyu linear height gauge. It's got a glass scale in it. If I push this button right here, it's gonna come up first, and then it's, we're gonna pull it out and it's gonna come back down and it's gonna give us the dimension of that part, which is awesome. Look at this. <laughs> seven tenths of a tenth. Just so we're clear, folks, that's 70 millionths. 9.969938. Yes, that's awesome. Literally under a tenth off, yes. When we push the button in, it floats on a set of air bearings, just like your air hockey table when you were a kid. And then we slide it up. Air bearing, scooter, I mean, it's really cool. Like literally, you, this thing weighs like 100 pounds and you're just floating it around. It also has a little stop where if you run it to the edge of the table, it loses pressure and it basically keeps it from falling off the edge of your surface plate. That's a good thing. I love it. One of the things on my to-do list for 2018 is we've seen some Instagram machinists who have gotten service finishes even better than this. I know we can do it. We've got to figure out that recipe of tying everything in together. It's going to be a combination of a great machine, great tools, getting the bricks in your coolant right, getting your feeds and speeds right. And sometimes from what I've heard, it's not just feeds and speeds from a scientific standpoint, but it's understanding harmonics and just what's the right fit for that material. We'd love some help or advice on that because it's something we're gonna do, but I was blown away. The, the removal rates and the sound and the quality of that cut on that roughing strategy, that was pretty cool, folks. Hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed. Take care, see you soon. <laughs>